This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV. Merry Christmas to you. I know I'm a little bit late because Christmas has passed. And Happy New Year. That's coming up in a few days. So I think I've covered all the bases. I hope you had a great Christmas and I hope you have a wonderful New Year. By the way, if you have not already done so, please do subscribe to Gun Guy TV at one of the alternative locations where we also publish videos beyond YouTube. That way, if something happens on YouTube, you'll be able to find us. And once in a while, I have to publish a teaser here on YouTube and then put the actual video someplace else because YouTube won't let me put it here because of content restrictions, which are, well, don't get me started. And then also, if you wouldn't mind, check out the Gun Guy TV Firearms Podcast. It is available on your favorite podcast player. All right, what am I, what am I doing here? First of all, welcome to my, uh, to my little covered porch in the back of my house. <laughs> the reason I'm back here is because we had a big rainstorm the other day and my shop floor was a bit of a casualty. We had some water leak in under the garage door into the shop floor and kind of flood an area of the shop. So I got all that vacuumed out with the uh, shop vac and now I got a bunch of fans and that kind of stuff in there kind of drying out the floor so I couldn't be in there to shoot video. So you're liable to hear the fans going. You may hear them in the background. You might hear my neighbor's truck start. You might hear an airplane go by. You might hear, uh, who knows, but anyway. <laughs> So forgive the uh, the loud noises around me, and we'll just talk about something extremely cool, and that is this 70s vintage Colt Python. This actually belongs to a friend of mine who's a collector, and he was kind enough to lend it to me. I cannot take it to the range and fire it for obvious reasons, uh, because he doesn't want it fired, and so he's given me strict instructions not to do that, and I do understand, but it's a great gun for me to talk about with you for a few reasons. One, uh, if you've watched the channel very long, you probably know that my father was a deputy sheriff in a rural county in Oregon, and his duty firearm was a Colt Python. Now, he was a cop in the late 50s and early 60s, mostly the early and mid 60s, and, uh, and as a result, these were not as horribly expensive then as they are now. Now they sort of demand stupid money if they're the original versions, not the new ones. This has the beautiful Colt Blue on it. There are some interesting things about these guns that, you know, it's always a subject of debate, Colt versus Smith & Wesson and so on. So let me explain to you from a practical perspective why my father chose, the, cho chose I can do this, why my father chose the Colts rather than the Smith & Wessons. Back in his day when they were issuing firearms, different departments issued different guns based upon whatever they chose to buy. In some cases, it was the Smith & Wesson Model 10, or and earlier than that, the Smith & Wesson Hand Ejector, which I think became the, the Model 10. Forgive me, I'm not a firearms historian. And then the other option was the Colt Police Positive. So if you got issued a Colt, and you went to go buy your own firearm to carry, a lot of times you would stick with the Colt manual of arms so you'd buy another Colt because they were different. If you were issued a Smith & Wesson, you might stick with a Smith & Wesson because the manual of arms was different. For example, the first gun I ever carried at work was a Smith & Wesson Model 10. So I'm kind of a Smith & Wesson guy. On the other hand, my dad's first gun that he carried at work was a Colt Police Positive. So he was a Colt guy. And here's the differences. For example, one difference is that with Colt, in order to open the cylinder and swing it out, you pull back on the cylinder release in order to open it. You don't push forward. On a Smith & Wesson, you push forward. This is my Smith & Wesson Model 66. You push forward to release the cylinder to swing it out. So that's one issue. And in the heat of the moment, if you're accustomed to pushing forward, you want to stick with that manual of arms and have a gun that does that because if you have to defend yourself and reload the gun in a hurry, you don't want to have to fiddle around to try to figure it out. And you don't want to have to retrain to learn something new if this has become habit for you or what people would call muscle memory. I don't think muscles have memories, but we do get in the point of doing things the same way over and over again out of uh, training or habit or whatever. Well, my habit is to push forward. My dad's habit was to pull back. And so he stuck with what he knew and what he and what worked for him automatically without his having to think about it. Here's another issue is that the Colt cylinder, if you can see it, turns clockwise. 
So when the gun is fired, the cylinder rotates clockwise, whereas the Smith & Wesson cylinder rotates counterclockwise. So you can see that. This one rotates counterclockwise. And if you ever can't figure out uh, which way your revolver goes and you have to think about it, all you have to do is look at the cylinder and look at the cylinder notch. If you look at the cylinder notches, they sort of look like a bullet that's pointed a certain direction. On a Smith & Wesson, you'll see that it's pointed in the counterclockwise direction, and that's why you can immediately tell it goes counterclockwise. If you look at the Colt revolver, you'll see that the cylinder bolt notch is actually pointed like a bullet in the clockwise direction, and that's the direction that the gun uh, rotates its cylinder. Now, if you go on the web and look at all the forums, you're going to find there's eight bazillion arguments as to why one goes one way and one goes the other. I've heard a lot of them. Uh, one is the argument that Colt was trying to figure out a way to make a double action revolver as opposed to a single action revolver and Smith & Wesson had the patent and so in order to make their gun different they decided to stick with the clockwise rotation in their revolver as opposed to the counterclockwise. Some people will say it's because many of the single action guns rotate clockwise and so Colt just stuck with that. The argument against that is that certain of the single action guns of the era did not rotate clockwise, they rotated counterclockwise and so you say, well gee, why? Uh, another argument is, and my dad used to like this, he got a kick out of it, and so he used to tell people this, is that the Colt rotates inward in the same direction that the cylinder swings to close. And since it rotates in the same direction the cylinder swings to close, then the, gu then the gun theoretically is trying to close itself all the time. Whereas the Smith & Wesson rotates in the same direction that you would swing the cylinder open, and so the, the Smith & Wesson is always trying to open itself all the time. And theoretic theoretically, this makes the lockup on the Colt stronger than the Smith & Wesson. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I think that's baloney, <laughs> because the Smith & Wesson locks up in the front and the back of the cylinder. And as far as I know, not being a gunsmith, I think the Colt only locks up in the back. It doesn't matter. They're both extremely reliable and they're really, really made uh, well-made guns. So I think the cylinder open-close thing is baloney, but that's nevertheless uh, what some people say. To me, it's just a matter of what you're accustomed to and what you're used to. The other issue with the cylinder rotating one way as opposed to the other is that in the day that my dad carried a gun like this, or in the day that I started carrying revolvers like this, you didn't have what are quaintly called, let me grab one, uh, here, speed loaders. Now, when these first came out, they were called six-second loaders, if I remember the marketing correctly. And the, re the, uh, the theory was that you could reload the gun in six seconds, which is much faster than you could do it by hand. But most guys didn't have this. What they had was on their Sam Brown belt, uh, mine was made by Tech Shoemaker, but nevertheless, is you had a pouch with six rounds just stacked in it and the pouch snapped closed. And most guys that I knew wore the pouch upside down so that when you unsnapped the pouch, the rounds fell loosely in your hand. So now you're defending yourself, you're in a gunfight, and you got six loose rounds in your hand. It's a very good chance you're not going to keep all six for some reason. If you're behind cover and you go to load your gun, it is important for you to know which way the cylinder turns because I have some snap caps here. Let's say I unloaded my pouch and I only kept three, two of them hit the ground. Well, now I'm going to have an empty cylinder, but if I know this and I load my gun one, two, three, and I know that the gun rotates to the right because I carry Colt, then I'm going to set it up so that first chamber is empty and the remaining rounds that I just loaded are on the left-hand side. So when I press the trigger, it's going, to, it's going to rotate the cylinder. My first round is going to go bang, bang, bang. On the other hand, if I'm carrying a Smith & Wesson, my cylinder rotates to the left. So I drop my rounds in my hand. I only got uh, three of my six. I'd one, two, three. Now I'm going to load this and I'm going to put it on the empty chamber before the round on the right because I know the cylinder is going to rotate to the left. And when I press the trigger the first time, I'm going to have a round go off. So if I'm hiding behind the engine block of a car because I've had somebody, you know, try to perforate me with bullets and they're banging away at me and I'm nervous and scared, back then it was very likely I might lose some of those loose rounds. It's important for me to know instinctively because I carry the gun all the time and this is the way it works, that that cylinder goes that way or it goes that way. Because if I don't, if I'm carrying a Colt 
and I'm used to the Smith, or I'm carrying a Smith and I'm used to a Colt, and I set it up the wrong way. Now I have to go click, click, click until I finally get those things to rotate around where the first round goes bang, and that could cost me my life. So it, it, regardless of what kind of gun you're using, whether it's a handgun or a rifle or a shotgun, if it's a fighting tool, you want to understand and be accustomed to the manual of arms of the gun, and it needs to be something that you do without thinking. And so as a result, since my dad started off with Colts, he stuck with Colts. Since I started off with Smiths, I stuck with Smiths. Is one better than the other? No. Not at all. They're both outstanding firearms. And even today, they're both outstanding firearms. Now, because of the beautiful finish of the Colt Python, it has that deep blue Colt finish. And because they had some mythos attached to them, and in my case, because I have some emotional attachment to them because it was the gun my dad carried, I think they're marvelous. But are they any better than a Smith & Wesson? No. Are they any worse than a Smith & Wesson? No. <laughs> They're just as good, fabulously made, American-made revolvers. The difference is that back then, there was a lot of hand-fitting involved, and this was a top-of-the-line Cadillac of the Colt line. And so everything was fitted beautifully. The trigger was magnificent, pretty much out of the gate, out of the box. Whereas some of the Smith & Wessons, the trigger wasn't quite as good out of the box, some of them it was, but if you take a smith down to a gunsmith, have them do a nice trigger job, you're going to get every bit as beautiful a trigger as you would get on a Colt Python. So don't think that that's, this is the god of triggers here. It's not. They are marvelous guns. They're incredibly accurate. They're a joy to shoot. And gee, I wish this one was mine, <laughs> but it's not. So I can't fire it. I have to take it back this afternoon or this evening and give it back to my buddy John. So... It kind of is what it is. But there you are. There's the Colt Python from the 1970s. I have not had an opportunity to review or fire or mess with the new ones, so I don't know if they're of similar quality. I certainly hope so. But uh, these things demand pretty high prices now. And I think there's a reason. They're a great collectible firearm. Well, thank you very much for watching. I hope this was instructive for you. Have a wonderful week and a fantastic new year. And thank you very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV. I'm very, very grateful. Wherever you go, whatever you do, stay safe.